All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to DEF CON. Welcome to Creator Stage. Thank you for all being here. Um, before we begin, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, number one, that these talks are being recorded and also being streamed. Um, as far as we just got word that there is some technical difficulty with the slides on the stream, so we apologize for that. Um, and yes, these, uh, the video of the talks will be available uh, eventually. Uh, you know, having done this for years, usually around, it could be really quick, or it could be in September or October. Um, for those of you, this is, if this is your first DEF CON, welcome, welcome, enjoy. And um, for this talk, it is proudly presented uh, by the Packet Hacking Village. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you someone we consider a friend for years. She is the author of The Active Defender. Uh, and uh, she also, and you are all in for a treat today, that she has some, she has fascination and also uh, good knowledge on mysteries and um, also the afterlife as well. Mmm, mmm. And it is my immense pleasure to introduce to you all our first talk and our friend, Dr. Catherine Allman. Thanks, Ming. So uh, and my, my handle is Investigator Chick for anyone who's looking. We'll cover that in a minute. Um, this talk has essentially two things going on in it. So you're going to see me giving a talk, but I'm also going to play the narrator role. So the, you will see two different things happening within this talk. So this is just me telling you a little bit first about what we're going to discuss. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information about myself, then we're going to talk specifically about the investigative process, then we're going to talk specifically about some individual elements of that process, scoping, data gathering, data analysis, data correlation, timeline analysis, and what goes on in post-incident. Um, and then I'll summarize and we'll do some Q&A. Who here has some background in digital forensics? A few of you. And who of you are just kind of like curious about digital forensics? A bunch of you. Okay, cool. It's good for me to really have a good feel for this. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, as I said, my handle is Investigator Chit Ick. Um, it's one letter too long. So if you look for me on Twitter or X, whatever they're calling it these days, it's Investigator Chit, uh, only because there's a letter missing. Um, and then on all the other platforms, it's Investigator Chick. So I've been at the University of Buffalo for over 24 years, going on to 25. I'm on staff at a bunch of conferences, um, including here, I'm with Packet Hacking Village. Um, I volunteer and am not full staff, but volunteer for a bunch of other things. I've done a ton of speaking and I really love sloths. So this is my boy Flash that you can kind of see up here in that corner. Uh, I adopted him at the zoo. <laughs> so let's talk about the investigative process. First of all, let's back up and talk about what forensic science is, especially since many of you are new to this field. So it's this idea that we're going to apply science, right, to criminal and civil law, although in some cases we're not even looking at the details of law. So um, in my case, um, I do a combination of things both with law enforcement, where that is the case, and I also do things like employee relations, so sometimes it's, it's policies. But generally speaking, one of the, history, the historians who is most important in this field is this awesome guy named Edmund Locard. Who's heard of Locard? Anybody? A couple people. All right. So he's, he's awesome. He was a French criminologist. And where he's really started was this idea of um, dactylography, which is the study of fingerprints. And a lot of what we use today came from what he originally created, which is pretty awesome. Um, and he was a pioneer and, and worked in this field. And there were other folks who were involved with it. And ultimately, he was the guy that we, we followed for the, for the fingerprint stuff. So this is his famous exchange principle. And it's this idea that 
you know, ultimately, if a criminal's going to do something, they're going to leave something behind, right? So every contact leaves a trace is the sort of generalization that we make for these folks. Um, but really what we're talking about um, is the, the exact quote is what you see on the slide here. That is what he actually said. So for, for digital forensics, we're talking about logs typically. So what do we mean by digital forensics? Well, it's digital forensics because we're talking about digital mediums, right? So digital devices, we're usually talking about computer crime, and we're going, to ident we're going to examine digital media and look for evidence of whatever it is in a forensically sound manner. I'm not going to read these um, descriptions to you because I know you can all read them yourselves, um, but this is the basic idea. And the process in digital forensics, and we'll see how this is a little different from traditional forensics, so things like DNA, um, we'll talk about in just a second. But what's really important is that we acquire this evidence that we're going to take a look at, and we're going to acquire it with the understanding that we're not going to change anything. We need something called chain of custody. So you can see that form on the, on the one side that talks about specifically, um, I know the, the form itself is sort of hard to read, but it, it's a property evidence form. So what happens is when you collect this information, so you, you, you get a computer, you get a drive, or you get something that you're going to image, it shows the transition of who had it from one to another. Because if you can't show a clear and distinct path that that evidence went, then something could have changed or been messed with. I'm sure at least some of you have heard about this on the news, yes? Yeah, so this is really important, especially in the, in the criminal side of things. Um, we use sometimes what are called write blockers. In fact, I, I almost always use write blockers because they, uh, there are physical and there are um, software kinds of write blockers. The thing you see the picture of in that bottom corner is a physical write blocker. So you plug your device into uh, whatever thing. So in the picture there, you see a thumb drive plugged into it. And then that prevents anything from being written or changed on the disk. Same basic concept with software, but um, hardware tends to be kind of the gold standard. And so we, we have to you know, authenticate. We have to make a copy of that information without changing the original. And that is how we do that. So I mentioned there's a distinction between traditional and digital forensics. Who watches things like CSI or, um, you know, any of the TV shows that deal with criminalistics? At least a few people, right? Yeah, and I get a lot of people who say, oh, that stuff's crap. And what I'll tell you is that's actually not true. There's a lot of stuff that's like legit on those shows. What's not real is the time frame. The time frames are like, you know, we're going to do a DNA analysis. It took 30 minutes. Badass. Except that, you know, in real life, DNA could take like months to come back because it's a very, very slow process. But with traditional forensics, like DNA, you have to destroy the evidence to actually collect it and analyze it. So for DNA, you take a sample, and that sample's run through a process, and the act of running it through a process changes it. Same thing with like something like fingerprints, right? When I collect a fingerprint, whether it's using um, tape or some other mechanism, you're altering that. You can't keep it pristine, but they don't expect that you can do that with digital forensics. It's a very big distinction. They don't want us changing anything. All right, so let's move along to the actual investigative process. So we have a number of steps. This is a very high-level talk. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about tools, mostly to kind of give you a hint about what kind of tools we use and maybe how we use them. But this is not a tool talk. So um, lots and lots and lots of talks cover forensic tools. So you, there's lots of stuff out there, but I wanted to focus more on the process and the mindset and the thinking behind this than I do about the specific tools. So these are gonna be our steps. So the first step is the scoping call. And oh, and I wanna mention that you're going to see this process often is not linear. We go from one to another and then we may go back and we may see that process um, need to be repeated. So let's go on to our next slide. So here, Woo! 
This is where I get to be your narrator. The scoping call. Detective Olivia Hart sat in her dimly lit office, the soft glow of her desk lamp casting long shadows across the worn wooden surface. The room was silent, save the occasional creak of the floorboards beneath her feet. She leaned back in her chair, running a hand over her tired eyes. Her cell phone rang, shattering the eerie silence. Detective, it's Captain Anderson. We've gathered some members of the digital forensics team to assist us with this latest homicide. The victim is Bob Bite. The sound of shuffling papers filled the air as team members began to take notes and prepare themselves for the investigation ahead. The captain ran through the basics, the time of discovery, the initial observations, and the victim's identity. Any leads, Hart asked, her voice cutting through the background noise on the line. We're focused on Alice Askey, Anderson replied, his mind racing as he considered the possibilities. We're currently interviewing friends and neighbors that they interacted with regularly. All right, Hart said, her tone firm and decisive. Keep us updated. All right, so the goals of the scoping call were things we just heard a little bit in the narrative, right? So we need a summary of what happened. We need a bunch of details about any individuals. We're gonna get some timestamps of some key events, and we'll get some other details around that incident, and we're going to establish the objective. What is it that you, as a forensicator, are tasked with doing? And today, you all get to be a little bit of a forensic investigator, because I'm gonna ask you to join me in this story. So this is the initial information you, as the forensic investigator, are given. Bob is dead. We knew this. He, the, the police are called to 456 Central Avenue. Bob is found deceased. He's found deceased at 12.01 a.m. on February 13th, 2022. And they estimate his time of death to be about three hours before that. Important note. What they, the cops tell us is that he appears to have been stabbed. And he's known to have this Re existing relationship with Alice Askey, the other name that we heard, and she lives at 123 Main Street. The police are pretty sure Alice went to Bob's house and killed him, and you've been asked to work with the, with the team to investigate the digital relevant information and determine Alice's involvement. These are the specific objectives you are given. The police have asked you to perform an, an analysis on the, on the information, and they want to know what evidence exists that proves Alice killed Bob, and why did Alice kill Bob? Now, I'm here to tell you, and the talk title of my talk hints at this. this is, these are not good questions for forensics. Forensics cannot tell you why somebody did something. It cannot tell you that someone did something at all. It can tell you what happened on a system. It cannot always put hands behind keyboards. So these are not necessarily good objectives. This kind of challenge is presented to us regularly in forensics. Open-ended questions are not things forensics can typically answer. We just discuss what kinds of questions forensics is not meant to, to cover. So like, you know, why someone did something, who, some, who did something specifically. You often have incorrect assumptions, right? What, in, what assumption did we hear that was a problem? Anyway, Alice killed Bob, right? Like, we're just getting started and we're already assuming Alice killed Bob. That is not a good thing. There are often unrealistic time frames and there are limitations to what we can recover. Sometimes the scope winds up being too huge and it has to be broken down. And sometimes uh, requests are incomplete. So like asking for a particular type of social media, but really wanting all the social media. So these are all challenges. So as a result, we revise those objectives to fit more with what forensics really can answer. So better questions that forensics can handle. Was there any activity on the devices around the time of death? Are there, is there evidence to indicate involvement, right? Not to say that someone definitely did something, but could there have been a person involved? 
And we want to look at all that relevant digital communication between Alice and Bob, since we know there is an existing relationship. That is a reasonable thing to do. The forensics team sprang into action, setting up their equipment and connecting cables to Bob's laptop. One technician began the process of creating a forensic image of the laptop, while another meticulously documented every step, every step, ensuring the integrity of the evidence. Meanwhile, Detective Hart scanned the room for any other digital devices that might hold clues. She spotted a smartphone lying on the floor near the victim's body and carefully begged it for further analysis. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the forensic team finished their work. They carefully packed up the equipment, leaving the room as they had found it. Simultaneously, additional police officers paid Alice Askey a visit at home. They encouraged her to do the right thing if she has nothing to hide. And as a result, they convinced her to provide her laptop and cell phone to them for examination, along, of course, with the passwords to these devices. So that, inf that evidence and the items collected at the scene were quickly turned over to the forensic lab for imaging and processing. So when we do data gathering, because this is the data gathering section, we may be da ga gathering data that's not necessarily digital. And this can be a real challenge because what happens sometimes, sometimes you go in the field doing this and you do it yourself, and sometimes somebody, a different team or other people go into the field. So sometimes you're gonna get different information from different folks at different times. It can be really chaotic. But these are the kinds of things that are examples of, of stuff we might collect. So, you know, we might have to take a forensic image on scene. You know, maybe we need some log files. It, this all really depends on the very specific case. What kind of tools do we use? Well, we use forensic tools like FTK Imager, NCASE, Xways, Axiom. You'll see a whole list here. We'll see some pictures. Sometimes scripts are used. Cameras are handy. Sometimes it's best to take photographs. We might see passwords on, I don't know, post-it notes. Because um, no one's ever seen that under a keyboard before, right? Nobody ever does that. So we might do um, video, but video is encouraged to do with no sound. Sound can get you in hot water because people sometimes say things on scene that maybe they shouldn't be saying. Um, and of course, sometimes you just take notes. Old fashioned paper and pen are great for that. So I know this is a little fuzzy, uh, but this is Axiom Gray Key. It's only available to law enforcement and uh, it's used to gather data off a, an, uh, phones typically and uh, it can do phone image extractions. So this is uh, within FTK Imager. FTK Imager is often used for acquisitions and analysis of files and file systems. And I know this is kind of tough to see. Um, the only thing you really need to pay attention to is the little tiny yellow thing that says uh, EX FVE, that little tip, and we'll see what that means later. And I'll have a blown up so you can see that better. This is NCASE Forensic. This is another really common tool uh, that is used for acquisition and analysis. And uh, this is Autopsy. Autopsy is a free tool, so I'm showing you a mixture, like NCASE costs money, FTK Imager is free. This uh, tool is also free and can do all kinds of cool analysis, acquisition, that kind of thing. And again, we'll get into some examples of, of that later. So these are some related questions. So often, because you have limited time frames, you have to know what you have to prioritize because if you only have so much time to do an investigation or to an analyze a particular piece of evidence, then it's problematic if you have tons of data, right, and you have to, you know, get through it all. Maybe, maybe you're not gonna get through it all, so maybe you need to prioritize. Um, you need to ask if you're not the one on scene, or even if you are, you might ask the other folks who were there, did you see anything interesting? And, you know, again, is there a restriction for the timeline? Now, there are a lot of challenges. We've already talked about a couple of them. You might acquire unnecessary data. So you might take a whole bunch of systems, take images of things, or take systems with you that are not related at all, and you may not know about that. Um, you might really need a piece of data that is completely unavailable. So the device is encrypted, you don't have a key. 
Maybe something's inaccessible, it's behind a login. Because by default, even doing a criminal case, you don't have the right to necessarily log in and grab that data, you need permission for that. Again, timeframes are always an issue. Maybe there's regulations, ISO or other regulations, right? So, it, which could tell you either you have to or you can't collect certain kinds of data. Maybe the stuff you brought to do the collection, wrong size, wrong dongles, wrong, you know, media, whatever. And maybe you're doing a collection of a particular type of file system that you don't have tools to, to, to collect. So this is the, that is the, the blown up screen of the FTK imager you saw earlier. Now, I can tell you that the digital forensics team, when they were working on this, they saw that. Does anybody recognize what that tells you? BitLocker, Bit Bit yeah. So the team was like, oh wow, this laptop's encrypted. So what they had to do is they had to take, they could not take a full image, right, because they don't have the password. What happens if they try to take a full image of this machine without a password? Yeah. You have an encrypted brick, spot on, right? So instead, they take what's called a logical disk image. And the logical disk image will capture basically whatever you can see sitting there working on it. But it's, you're not gonna see some of the underlying data systems. All right. The whirring of hard drives mingled with the soft glow of computer screens in the brightly lit forensics lab. Detective Hart stands at the helm, her eyes sharp and calculating. She scans the array of devices laid out before her. Two laptops, two cell phones, each holding secrets, waiting to be unearthed. Beside her, Maya Patel, the team's lead forensic expert, delicately examines the data retrieved from Alice and Bob's laptops. Meanwhile, across the room, Agent Mark Thompson meticulously dissects the data from their cell phones, his brow furrowed in concentration. With each tap of his fingers, he builds back layers of text messages and call logs, his determination unwavering as he hunts for clues. All right, so the goals of data analysis, we're gonna look for scoped indicators. So remember that we had some goals in terms of what we were, uh, our objectives were. So in terms of being given that initial information, you know, we're looking for names, right? We might be looking for user accounts, anything that would sort of point back to what uh, we were told in the beginning. And then from there, we might pivot because we might find something interesting. So, you know, you might see a particular keyword that might take you to something else. You need to document those findings. And timestamps are critical. If you take nothing else away from this and you're interested in forensics, universal time, UTC is your friend. I see some smiles out there. How many of you that do digital forensics are like, oh my God, why won't they just give me everything in UTC? Yeah, so um, the, one of the most frustrating things is that you sometimes get logs in all these different time zones and then you have to correlate everything, which we'll talk about later, and that's a major pain in the drain. So make sure that you're documenting not only the time, but what time zone, whether it's UTC or not, whatever. Um, you know, where'd you find it? Uh, if, you know, if there's code, you know, you want all of that information. And document anything that's weird that maybe you don't see that you would expect to see because a lack of evidence is itself evidence. We use a bunch of different tools for data analysis, very similar to what we saw for collection because a lot of these tools do the same thing. So our, we already saw a magnet gray key. They have another product called Axiom, which is available to, uh, to regular forensicators, not just law enforcement. We talked about autopsy. Eric Zimmerman has some free tools. Um, there's something called Obsidian Forensics Hindsight, which I believe is free. We've already mentioned NCASE, X-Ways, FTK, and there's also a product called Nuix. Celebrate Inspector, which is again phones, and Volatility, which is for memory forensics. So this is Celebrate Physical Analyzer, which again can be used to recover an image and do some analysis on phones. Um, you know, and often you use more than one tool to get the best results because one tool may only give you a certain 
piece of what you're looking for and sometimes you need two. So this is magnet forensic, forensic axiom. So this is the tool that is available to, to anybody who purchases it. And uh, again, it can be used for magnet, for um, looking at mobile or cloud, uh, computer, vehicle sources, it can do all kinds of stuff. And the evidence you're going to see today was processed with Axiom uh, to provide some SMS logs. So let's take a look at that. So this is a snippet of what that looks like. This is Axiom Forensics, and that's, this is the overview screen. And this is Hindsight Internet History Forensics, which is used for parsing internet history. Now let's talk about the challenges, okay? So again, you need permissions. If something's behind a login, you can't just go, you know, ah, I'm a, even if you're law enforcement, you can't just be like, ah, I'm gonna go looking at all the things. You might ignore it, relevant evidence. Perhaps you collect all kinds of stuff and you're like, ah, this isn't relevant, doesn't matter, I don't care about this. And that's really easy trap to fall into, especially if you have a ton of stuff and you're and you have a short timeline. It's easy to assume something is irrelevant and then find out later maybe it wasn't. So maybe you don't have the right tools to analyze. Maybe you suddenly find there's malware on something, but um, the issue is really somebody who's dead. Maybe the malware is just, you know, they do, they're, they're involved in other extracurricular activities and they got malware from that. So you gotta be very careful you don't go down the wrong rabbit holes. Um, it's very easy to get tunnel vision. I'm looking for this, I'm only looking for this, and then, oops, and I'm seeing a bunch of nods because, yeah, some of you have been there. Um, and follow through is really important, right? You gotta follow the, if once you start down that rabbit hole, you often have to follow it all the way down. So here's where we're gonna get into what I think is the interesting stuff, right? The meat and potatoes. So this is an SMS conversation between Alice and Bob. And this is, uh, once you take something like Axiom, you can then export the log information into a spreadsheet. And I know this is impossible to read. So instead, I'm gonna give you the conversation in a much easier place to read. So I'll give you just a, a minute or so. We're gonna see that, you know, Bob and Alice are having a conversation. Alice is like, Bob, we gotta talk. And ultimately, what, when, and, when, when, we, uh, when we get to the end, because there's one more slide here. So, so what's the tone here? What do we think? Hostile, right? How about on this one? This is a continuation of the previous. There's one more. Yeah, it's threatening, right? Yeah. How about how it ends? Yeah, not good, right? She's kind of digging a hole. So we get some information from PD. They let us know that Alice's fingerprints were all over the victim's house, including on a kitchen knife that has a profile that's very similar to the murder weapon. Interesting. There's also some evidence that is a conversation between Bob B, we know Bob Bite, right? And some mystery person. So Agent Thompson shows this to you and makes it much easier to read this way. This is a much shorter conversation. So this seems, what? A little sketch, but you know, Okay, so, I mean, this is just some evidence that's collected. So then the PD comes back. They've been, you know, talking to, to folks to find out more information. And they find out they're really concerned about Bob because Alice has a temper. We don't know that at all from reading the evidence we saw, right? And they also noted that Bob, the neighbors have said, gee, Bob seems to have folks that come all hours of the night and maybe drugs, maybe there's some drug smuggling, something going on there. Interesting. So then they start looking at some email logs. And the tool that's used here is called Paraben E3. This is a tool that's specifically used to investigate email. And Maya shows you this and says, huh, this is a Lyft receipt she got from Alice's computer. And it indicates that Alice did in fact travel to Bob's house on the day of the murder. 
And here is it blown up so you can see it a little better. So we can see the pickup at 123 Main Street, which we know is Alice's house, and the drop off at 456 Central Avenue. And we see that this is in fact at least one of Alice's emails. We'll get there. Good observation though. As the hours stretched on, the team's efforts began to yield results. My unearthed number of potentially important emails from the laptop while Mark's fingers fly across the keyboard, cross-referencing timestamps and GPS coordinates in a relentless pursuit of the truth. His analysis of metadata ultimately reveals a pattern of communication that can be linked to the prime suspect in this case. Through trial and error, they each piece together fragments of information, every breakthrough bringing them one step closer to unlocking the answers they are seeking. So once we have all of this data, we need to correlate it, right? Bring all of this stuff together from all these different places that we've pulled it, normalize the findings, Again, timestamps are your friend and they need to all be in one UTC time zone so that you get a much better picture of what happened. And then we're gonna look for some patterns which will help us build a picture of what actually happened. So how do we do that? Well, we use some tools, things like mind mapping software and I've given some examples, but good old pen and pen paper or even a regular old spreadsheet can be good for that. In this case, so far, what do we have? Well, we have SMS messages from Bob and Alice's phones. We saw the email. We got some information from PD. We can run into challenges at this particular place, too. Not enough context might be provided. We might dismiss something as irrelevant. Again, back to time frames. We might just not take the time to correlate. So then we're going to build a timeline. In the hushed confines of the digital forensic lab, the team gathered around a large whiteboard, their eyes fixed on the intricate timeline taking shape before them. Detective Hart stands at the forefront, her gaze intent as she directs the assembly of evidence into a coherent narrative. Next to her, Maya and Mark meticulously arrange timestamps and digital artifacts, weaving together threads of data to reveal the chronological sequence of events they uncovered. Each piece of information begins to fit into the puzzle that was the grand design of their investigation. Across the room, Dr. Maya Rodriguez, the forensic psychologist, examines the psychological profiles of the individuals involved, her insights providing a crucial layer of context to the timeline. With each revelation, she uncovers the layers of motive and intent, shedding light on the human elements driving the digital drama. Why is it important that we have someone like that involved? Any guesses? Right. I mean, there's so much that we don't know, right? So understanding the people involved can be crucial. And what did I say digital forensics itself is not good at? It's not good at people, right? It, it can tell you that a human probably was at a keyboard doing a thing, but it can't necessarily tell you who or why. All right. So the goals of timeline analysis we're gonna be looking for timestamps with everything. Again, UTC. Make sure you understand the attributes that you're collecting, and then we're gonna create a timeline. So tools that can be used with that for that purpose, again, Axiom. Um, there's also a free tool called Log to Timeline. Excel is great. There's a free tool called Timeline Explorer. We can have challenges with this, Maybe the stamps are, time stamps are missing, and maybe we don't know the particular time zones. Uh, maybe we just forget about time stamps and we just overlook them. So this is the tiny timeline of what we've uncovered so far. We know that Alice sends Bob threatening texts. We know when Bob is killed, and then Bob is discovered deceased. So what is your initial hypothesis based on the evidence provided? Well, yeah, I mean, that, it's an interesting question, but if you only had what I gave you so far, what does it appear to be? That, that Alice did it, right? Okay. 
So initially, our hypothesis is Alice killed Bob because this is scientific evidence-based forensics. We're always going to do a hypothesis and then see if we can prove the hypothesis or disprove the hypothesis. Who here has seen the movie Clue? A bunch of you. Okay. So that's how it could have happened. And Detective Hart looks at you when you come up with that hypothesis and says, hmm, there's evidence that suggests that could in fact be the case, but have you exhausted your search of all the evidence? Because I hear PD still has some information for all of you, and they might have more information for us soon. So how about this? And look, we're back to data analysis again, because we're going to look at some more data. So I know one of you caught this, right? What did we not focus on when we looked at this the first time? The, the timestamp, right? The timestamp was an hour after Bob was dead. So Alice went there, but a little too late to kill him if he's already dead. A little weird. And then uh, Maya discovers on Bob's machine that there was some acti web activity. And if you look carefully at some of this web activity, again, the timestamps are showing you after his time of death. Very strange. And if you look at some of the, the, dis the descriptions here, we see some phishing things and some relationship counseling because we know there was a relationship going on there. Kind of interesting. So then we look further. Maya continues to look for evidence on Alice's email. She finds another email address and she finds this very peculiar thing in Alice's email. What do you see here? Bob's password and username, right? Huh, interesting. So PD comes back to you and says, I interviewed Alice Askey and she found when she got there, Alice admitted she found him deceased and knew she would be somebody they would look at. And she was so freaked out that she thought, I know, I'll log into Bob's machine, I'll pretend to be Bob, and it'll be fine, because then they'll know it wasn't, you know, it was somebody else. So she admits to this. So, uh-oh, it's not Alice. So here's what really happened. Just as they thought they were closing in on their target, a new challenge presents itself a strange file containing a bunch of random characters buried deep within the directory of Bob's computer. Determined not to be thwarted, the team pooled their expertise, each member contributing their unique skills to uncover this latest mystery, which turned out to be an encrypted file. And finally, as the first light of dawn filtered through the windows of the lab, they triumphed. The encrypted file yielding its secrets and providing the missing piece of the puzzle they needed to solve the case. The team sat down to just, oh, I'm sorry, that's the next bit. So, PD comes back to you. Remember that thread we saw, that conversation between Bob and some mystery person? Well, it turns out that was somebody named Charlie C. Hmm. We're back to data analysis again, because now we need some stuff about Charlie C. But as we're looking, this is where Maya discovers this very strange encrypted file. It's a strange size. It's certainly nothing obvious. It's kind of hard to see, but it's, it's a uh, it's file that, uh, well, let me go back a slide here. You can see that it's Microsoft. It looks like Minesweeper, but it's a weird name and a very strange size. And the gobbledygook that you see in this, what's called a hex editor, for those of you unfamiliar, this tells us this file is encrypted. And because it's encrypted, Maya starts looking for other things having to do with encryption. And she finds something called Veracrypt installed on Bob's laptop. She knows that that software can create an encrypted file. And she also, has a tool called TC Detective. 
she runs that tool against this weird file and in fact confirms this is the tool that was used to encrypt that file. Hmm. It's just a it's piece of Python code. So this is something called Shell Bag Explorer that Maya runs. And again, I'll show you the, the, um, this blown up so you can see it better. But Shell Bag Explorer is a free tool that you can use to explore something called a shell bag. What is a shell bag? It is a registry entry that shows you information about user preferences and some of their activities. In this particular case, it shows you a really weird mount point called secret stuff, because that doesn't sound sketch at all. So it can show you this tool, things like right clicks and mount points, and it's part of, for those of you familiar, registry uh, keys called ntuser.dat uh, and userclass.dat. So what we see here is this, you know, again, this, this path, very interesting. And then PD comes back and they say, hey, check it out. We found this post-it note with some passwords. And Maya says, I wonder what I can do with those. So she gets a copy of Veracrypt on her forensic in, uh, machine, and she loads it up, and she gets a copy of this file, and she mounts it with Veracrypt, and it is successful, and she opens it. And in this, she finds five files, four weird pictures of money, and a text file. Hmm. Well, these are the, or five weird pictures of money. So here's some pictures of money. Anybody see anything common about this, these pictures of money? Yes. The serial numbers, right? Don't say too much. Who here knows exactly what this is when you looked at it? A couple of you, right? Typically, it's folks who either work with law enforcement or no law enforcement folks. Um, but we'll get there. She initially doesn't think they're relevant at all, but, hmm. So then you have a further conversation with Detective Hart, and you find out Charlie C. is known for dealings in his drug world, and he is, in fact, Charlie Cyber. You look at that text file, and you realize this is some kind of ledger file, and we see some names that we recognize, right? Alice, Bob, and now Charlie. So that's interesting. Then PD says, ooh, there's a ring camera. We just discovered it. It has a view toward the victim's back door. And camera footage obtained from it shows Charlie Cyber entering Bob's house via the back door moments before Bob's death and exiting shortly thereafter. So now we have more data we have to correlate. These are all the pieces we have to correlate, right? So back to the beginning, all the SMS messages, the emails, the encrypted space with the hidden file, the reports from PD, the ring camera. PD comes back to you, the forensicators, and says, oh, oh, those pictures of money. So those are actually used by drug dealers. Drug dealers, so when you're a drug dealer and you're dealing with other drug dealers and they don't necessarily know who each other are, funny this, they don't go, look, this is my ID, see, this is me, it's who you thought it was, right? So the way they do identity matching is that they will give you part of a serial number and when you meet, you show them the whole serial number and that's how they know that it's the same person that they've been communicating with and the person they're supposed to do the deal with. And this is something that law enforcement actually sees on a fairly regular basis. So based on all that evidence, what we ultimately determine is that Charlie killed Bob. And if we think back about that conversation between now we know Bob and Charlie, right? Who was trying to get out of working with him? What did Bob want to do? Yeah, Bob wanted out. He was like, he's like, I'm gonna, do, I'm going on my own. I'm gonna do my thing, and Charlie didn't seem real happy about that. But that didn't necessarily seem relevant until we had the rest of these pieces and found out there were drug dealings, and that's actually what was going on. All right.
The team sat down to discuss the case they had just concluded. Each one took their place at the table, their expressions a mix of, of in exhaustion and satisfaction, a testament to the arduous journey they had taken, undertaken to solve this mystery. Detective Hart opened the meeting with a solemn nod, signaling the start of their post-incident analysis. Her guys swept across the room before settling on the whiteboard in front of them, where a timeline of events was displayed in meticulous detail. All right, everyone, let's begin, she said in a, her, force, her voice steady and authoritative. So just because we've solved the case effectively and all the pieces have come together, that does not mean we're done. We've got goals, what are called post-incident goals, and these are critical as well. We need to discuss what went well and what did not go well. Maybe we didn't have the right tools. Maybe we did things in the wrong order. Maybe we didn't look carefully at all of our evidence as we saw here, right? What outcomes were achieved, positive and negative? Because again, we kind of want to look at this whole big picture. We need feedback from all the different teams that are involved because nobody does this stuff in a vacuum. And one of the challenges in many cases is that forensicators and the detectives, while they work together, they're often separated um, significantly. Technical challenges that maybe can be you know, handled later on. And you want to document everything that happened and didn't happen. So if you attempted something and it didn't work, that all has to be documented as well. What do we use to document that? Well, you know, pe paper, pen, computer, you know, whatever it takes, right? It can be, theoretically, it continue to be photographs and all the kinds of things we've talked about for documentation. The challenges involved in all of this, lots of folks forget to document. They just are in too much of a hurry and they don't write up a report and then by the time they actually need that information, it's way too late and they forget things. You could forget to document specific things you might document something that didn't happen because you started down a rabbit hole and you knew that's what was gonna happen and so you started writing it down and then you find out, oops, and you forget to delete that. Or you go down that path and instead of deleting, you say, well, we thought it was this, but we, you know, we got to a point and it wasn't that. Another problem is the full story could not be told through documentation. It requires the reader to make assumptions and that's not a good thing either. And an after action report should always be held. So that is ultimately the story of Alice and Bob. I have to do a little tiny bit of shameless self-promotion here. Uh, I have a book here called The Active Defender. For those of you who are new to the Defender space, um, what this book does is it looks at defense from an offensive perspective. Because I discovered when I started my journey down this path that ultimately Defense is only half the story. If you don't understand what your offensive counterparts are doing, you don't have to know all the little fiddly technical details, but if you don't understand what they do, you will never understand how attackers work and you will not be an effective defender. So I wrote this book basically to give back to a community that has given me a ton because I started in the music industry. I did not start in technology. And so I like to quote, close with this quote and then we'll open it up. I think we still have a couple minutes for questions. So I may not have gone where I intended to go, bachelor's degree in music industry, but I think ultimately I wound up exactly where I need to be. And with that, do I have any questions? Yes. So the two things that were mentioned had to do with exculpatory evidence, and I purposely didn't go too far into that because, you know, knowing that a lot of the folks in the audience, this is all very new to them, I wanted to keep it fairly high level. Um, the, the question in particular was what do, what do I use for documentation? Um, whatever tool works, so paper, pen, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, 
Um, I have some, in some cases, I have forms that I use regularly for certain kinds of cases. Sometimes you have to go outside the box because the case is weird. Um, but I, I, there's nothing magical or special about any of that. It really depends on, on your use case. So if a, if a word form works well for you or a spreadsheet works well for you, then that's perfectly fine. Does that help? Is there any tool that I've run into problems with if I've asked to produce my notes? No, the biggest problem is um, either having notes on like the back of a napkin and then you literally have to turn in the napkin. So that that's one of the big, I mean, I haven't personally run into that, but it's something they warn you about. Um, you know, pretty much as long as you can show your documentation and you're not missing anything, I've never had an issue. I saw another question, hand in the back. Sure. Well, I, I missed the last bit, what? Yeah, so he's saying he does incident response and they just do Word Docs. So yeah, DFIR is my, is my specialty and I do all kinds of different things in that space. And Word Doc are your friend and having, a, having templates for different kinds of things can be really helpful. Other question, yes? So the question is, I started in music industry, could I talk about the steps to make the switch? I'm gonna give you the like two second abbreviated version and then I'm happy to discuss it further offline. Um, and I just gave a talk, um, I, the, I did a closing keynote for Trimark where I actually tell the really long version of that story and that was recorded and you're happy to, you're, you're welcome to check that out. So the really short answer is, um, my father worked uh, at the computing center at the local college in the town where I grew up. And I was actually around all of this stuff forever. And when I suddenly became unemployed because I was working for a, a record store after I'd worked for a couple different record companies, and the owner of that store and that small chain decided that paying taxes was optional and New York State said otherwise, and they, I had to find another career option. And a good friend of mine that I was talking to said, why don't you go into to tech? Because this was you know, in the mid 90s when lots of places were hiring for support roles on the phone. And I started down that path that way. How I wound up doing investigation work, um, I had a good friend at a later job who um, started to look at worms and other infections, and I was fascinated by what he was learning. He shared some stuff from SANS with me, and, and that's kind of the direction I wound up taking. The university where I work ultimately needed somebody to do uh, forensics for compliance, and I built that program for them. So that's the super duper short answer. We might have time for one more, yes. So, so the question has to do with the fact that I work with law enforcement, but I'm not in law enforcement, and why do they come to me for stuff? So, I because I work for university, I have access to all of our data points, right? I have access to all of our logs. I know the people who can get stuff for us if I can't, um, and so they come to me in part because they want that data, and in some cases they want to understand that data better. If it is a case that is actually going to go to a criminal court, then we collect the system and that goes down to our, our uh, regional forensics lab. I don't work those cases because that really needs to be specially handled. But when we have employee relations issues, I will do full forensic cases for employee relations that's not law enforcement and do those kinds of things. And I think folks, we're just about out of time. I'll hang out for a minute or two here as long as I'm allowed and then I will be out there uh, if you need me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you DEF CON for bringing me in.